Welcome to the Unknown Webcast. Here we are in December, and there are only three weeks left until Christmas. I have had a bit of a difficult time shopping, I have to say, because I really am so conservative that I can't turn left even when I'm driving, which makes it difficult to get to the stores. Uh, that means, obviously, this is not a safe space for those who may be easily offended by having their ideas challenged or by our satire. This is broadcast number 125, and uh, this week we have uh, Ed Havich joining us to dig into origins, biogenesis, and population. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast, and our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, who will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast, and here's the infamous Ron. Wait a minute, Don. I'm confused. We have satire here. Yes, that actually is satire. It's not you know, the stuff that we're about to show everybody is satire. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. I, I just need to straighten that out. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its shadow, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Yes, our sponsors for this program include Where's the Outrage, the board game in which the woke shall inherit the earth, and the Bible Buffet. It's not your father's worship experience, the Bible Buffet. And if you like this program or if you really hate it and you just want to annoy other people with it, to ensure continued access, please go to MidwestOutreach.org. Click the yellow donate button and contribute as you feel led. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. And now back to the same people in our program. The same people, yes. one of which is our friend and uh, becoming more of a regular uh, offender <laughs> on our <laughs> webcast, Ed Havich, uh, who I love dearly. I like the way his mind works. And sometimes when we're uh, both at the same conferences and teaching or whatever, or just uh, interacting on the phone, uh, I'll say something. He'll say something which sparks another story really? that we that you like, we had. Uh, you like the way out. you like the way his mind works, and you like it when my mind works. So, that, I, so that, I, well, that's your how, mind that's always works. The problem together. isn't that your mind works; it's that it <laughs> that it follows rabbit trails all over the place, and we have to somehow send out hunting parties to find out where you I know. Went. I know where the rabbits are going, though. <laughs> that's because you dropped the rabbit food, I think. Yes. Um, but uh, we, Ed, Ed and I, we, we kind of like talking, like you, like like Ron, you, you and I like talking about a number of different sorts of topics. We're not just limited to one genre of thought. Uh, and uh, one of my uh, favorites happens to be uh, in the area of uh, where origins, where we came from, and then Darwinism. And and I was sharing with Ed that uh, some years ago I had a, a Christian group, Athletes for Christ it was, uh, on a college, uh, a junior college campus that had contacted me and said, would you uh, debate one of our professors who was uh, a Darwinist? He, he believes in Darwinian evolution. And I said, love to, be great. Uh, and uh, then uh, I got a call a few weeks later that said, well, we have this set up, but he wanted to know, are you a young earth creationist or an old earth creationist? And I said, well, I, I tend to be a young earth creationist. Uh, I'm not sure how that impacts it because the question isn't when. The question is uh, how. Did it form from nothing by nothing for no apparent reason or was there an intelligent designer? And so uh, they went back to him and he said, well, I wouldn't get caught dead in a room with a young earth creationist. And so he declined the debate. They had me come and give a presentation anyway. And, and uh, uh, after my presentation, several of the students came up to me afterwards and said, well, the way you tell it, it sounds like, creationism is true and i went well duh you know that's what i believe <laughs> you had me in so they then went to the professor and said okay he gave a presentation would you come in and give a presentation and he said sure and i heard when he was going to be there and i showed up as i am want to do at times oh, so uh, you were in the same room with him i was he didn't and realize it until he was done because i sat in the front row where i could kind of get eye to eye with him and i listened you know, I was quiet, listened uh, respectfully. And afterwards, he gave his presentation. I raised my hand. And I said, well, I do have one question. He said, okay. I said, I have to set it up. So you got to kind of go with me to get to the question. And and that is this. Let, let's assume everything you said is true. Let's assume 
that in the beginning was nothing and it for reasons un, un, unapparent reasons it just exploded into everything i'm not sure how it would do that but let's just assume that's the case and uh so now we've gone from nothing to everything unguided time plus chance and now we have you know well we'll call them i don't know stars and planets uh, in something we'll we might call a universe. Let's just assume that all of that happened, and and in in at least one uh, of the more solid masses floating around there in this newly uh, created universe uh, is uh, uh, something we'll call Earth. It's a, a planet we'll call Earth, and and on this planet we'll call Earth. There was this primordial soup that came from no reason, just from no place. It just sort of popped into existence. Let's assume that happened. And then for so no reason at all, 21 amino acids just sort of jumped out of that and came together and created a cell. Let's just assume all of that's true. How do we get then? Here's my question. From single cell multiplication, which is undeniably the easiest way to reproduce. You don't have to meet anyone. You don't have to date anyone. You don't have to spend any money, you know, anything like that. You just divide and multiply. It's very simple. Two, male-female reproduction. How, what are all the steps in between that? And and we know, actually, that it's fairly complicated because this one thing doesn't work. Uh, reproduction doesn't happen. And that's why we have fertility clinics. So it seems to me that what you have to have is, oh, I don't know, maybe a, a female just appear uh, fully developed, ready to reproduce at a point in time, but you still don't have reproduction because, you know, you got to have a male also. And so you have to have a male pop into existence, fully formed and ready to reproduce. And, and uh, oh gosh, it still doesn't solve the problem really because they have to come into being at about the same time in history. Uh, wouldn't do to have them, you know, six, seven hundred, eight hundred years apart. Uh, and that still doesn't solve it because they'd have to be in about the same geographical location. Wouldn't do to have one in Alaska and one in Argentina, for example. So you can just you can just ask this question: How did we get two genders? You couldn't do that. You had to do go through all of this. I, I, I had to go through all of that. I had to go the long way around to get to that to make my point. And he looked at me; his eyes kind of glazed over, and he said, "I don't know, but I'm sure there's an answer." <laughs> You gotta so, have faith. You gotta have faith, brother. Got well. That's what I said. You have you have to have like a half a dozen miracles. In other words, you have to have faith that Darwinism is true. Uh, it isn't actually science. It is a religion. It is faith. Uh, and he had to agree with that in the end. He didn't really know what to do with that. So uh, I was kind of sharing that with uh, with Ed, and then he started to tell me a, a story about a discussion he had with a scientist about biogenesis and so now ed is back with us uh can you hear me ed lost sound you lost sound but was that a response or was that uh... well he's he can see my lips are moving but he can't hear me oh okay and now he's coming and going well so... this will be interesting can we speak in sign language? Can you do lip reading? Uh, maybe maybe if we I use the uh, the uh, telephone. Uh, well, I've I've tried calling him, but it just uh, it doesn't seem to go through. Okay. So that'll be interesting. So this is how we got here today. Uh, <laughs> As you can see, we're oh, right. Yeah. But the only thing is, I'm not naked in front of the computer, which and neither is uh, Tom. I'm, 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 I'm glad to hear that. that. Yeah. So that's how we got here today. Um, so, um, what? Oh, I just heard something. Is that you? Yeah. So I'm not sure what's going to happen here because I think I Ed, is, Ed is coming and going right now, or going and coming back. He just hung up on us. And um, so. Um, what uh, I can do is I can, I should I should have a a slide prepared for this event uh, in case this happens, like uh, like a picture of Ed, and then we could just mimic his voice or something. Uh, well, I was just I was thinking of something a little little more useful than that. Um, 
he 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 says he lost sound. I don't know if he means he can't hear us, but I think that's what it means. Um, okay, well, that's so probably why don't you keep means. talking? And uh, I am. Uh, is he back yet? Okay, no, yeah, he is. There he is. Well, we we can see his face. We can see him moving around, shaking his head. And uh, there we go. Can you hear oh, us, I like that. Ed? Can you hear us, Earth to Ed? Earth to Ed. Uh, he's looking over there. That doesn't help. Look over here. So, <laughs> all right. Now we have three viewers. It's funny that once we lost the sound on Ed, our number of viewers is is steadily increasing. Uh, I won't bother to tell him that when he comes back, but. Um, <laughs> well, while while he is kind of sorting this out, we may have to have him uh, uh, come in by phone. I wonder if he has a smartphone. I wonder if he can. If you can, can you call him? You you, you could not call him. I either. tried. I tried. It's, it's, it's telling me that he's uh, not available. Oh, okay. Uh, so. So what I will do is we'll put this back up again, and uh, the uh, uh, why does it take so long to do that? Uh, share. <laughs> All right, I don't know what he's seeing. Uh, yeah, I don't even know if he's even seeing us. This is very interesting. Somebody has already left our program because of this. So why don't we just? Um, Keep on talking. What uh, you're talking about Darwinian evolution, right? Well, yeah, that's that's kind of the starting point, and I I do want Ed to weigh in if we can get him here. But uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, I was I, I believed in evolution uh, when I before I became a believer, uh, before I became a Christian, because that's what I was raised on. Uh, you know, in in school when I was coming up, creationism wasn't taught at all. Uh, and to me, that was the only game in town. I was, my father was an atheist. I was an atheist, uh, following his footsteps. Uh, and so the idea that uh, we had evolved, like most who subscribe to atheism, we start sort of in the middle of the story. We we go from apes to man, and somehow that seems satisfactory to us, like it makes sense. We don't usually think of the questions before that, that precedes that. Like, where did everything come from to begin with? How do you go from nothing to something? How does that work exactly? And and I haven't found any credible answers well, to that. You, you, the question you asked has to do with how, I mean, when you, when you consider the number of mutations that have to take place to move from um, asexual to sexual reproduction, uh, they it's it's kind of mind-boggling and I don't think people are aware of that um, but you know the whole premise of Darwin's black box was much simpler and yet equally difficult to deal with which was how do you go from non-life to life because arguably the number of genetic changes that are required or we'd have to really say genetic inventions that are required are far more mind-bogglingly uh, numerous than the amount that it takes to, to, to take an existing, an existing uh, organism that already has DNA, that already has, you know, genes, that already has chromosomes. It already has an incredibly high amount of, of complexity. And I don't think people realize even a single cell organism right. has an incredibly high level of complexity. And it's it's far easier to explain how they pair off into uh, genders or sexes than it is to explain how they got there in the first place. So, right, which was kind of the, my point to the the professor. I tried to grant as much of of w really our matters of faith prior to even the process of evolving into separate genders. Uh, uh, as I as I possibly could, but and at the same time, kind of show show how uh, almost uh, silly it is to believe that it is a, a giant leap of faith to believe that from nothing everything sprang. How does that work? Uh, and I have, uh, as as you know, John, I, Ron, I have a uh, um, 
part-time job uh, and working for delivering mail from the post office distribution center to the post offices. Uh, and uh, they have a real hard time keeping their time schedules. And so I have uh, acquainted them with uh, the late Stephen J. Hawking had a problem because time itself is a function of the uh, universe. Space Without the universe be... operating, you don't have time because right. that's what measures it, right? Absolutely. And so, and so he, he realized he had a problem with that. And so what he had to do to, to deal with that is he created imaginary time. And, and we realize that's how the office, uh, post office works. They work on the right? <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh, does, does Eddie have a Facebook page? I I don't think so. I, I, I guess I don't know. And we can't get his attention, so I don't know what to say. Okay. Uh, um, well, what, uh, why don't we talk about Ed uh, and explain to our audience why he's on the program? Well, Ed, Ed Havich is, uh, any have turned, tuned in before, Ed has been around for a long time. Uh, dealing with cults mostly, he's got a real passion for evangelism, and uh, and he loves playing in the world of ideas. And so he reads a lot, and he has spent some time kind of dealing with the question of biogenesis. Uh, and for those who don't know what uh, biogenesis is, it's the idea, as I I talked about the 21 amino acids. Well, how do they come here? Where do they come from? And biogenesis is, is the attempt to answer that question. Where, how did life, the spark of life begin? Uh, and uh, generally the idea is that uh, uh, the primordial soup existed, lightning struck the primordial soup, and out of that life sprang. So, and he kind of has fun with it, but I don't know what to do uh, about this because I don't know how, we can't even get his attention. You know, I I, uh, I have a record of, of contacting him by Facebook Messenger uh, back in uh, some pre back in January. <laughs> we had the same problem. Uh, so uh, yeah, there you go. I'm trying to see well, if I can. Yeah, I wanted to see if we can see if he responds to that. Maybe if he has a smartphone, we can get him to just dial him via smartphone. I lost, okay, he says he lost sound. Uh, can you call us on the phone? Uh, not, not, not just call us, but if he could use, if he's got a smartphone, he could tune in just like uh, other folks have. Uh, so, oh, I'm getting an audio call right now. I'm from him. Okay. So I'm going to be talking to him, but I don't think you'll be able to hear him. Hey, Ed. Oh, uh, he's calling me, Ed. Testing, testing. Now, see, audience, this is how things work in real uh, life. Let's see. Um, yeah, he he really has lost sound. Uh, well, if he has if he has a smartphone, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm hearing him now. Hey, Ed. Um, so, uh, Don says if you have a smartphone, you can. Uh, well, Don, explain it to me so I can explain it to him. We we could we could send him the link uh, to his Facebook site, and he could just uh, dial in and connect through his smartphone. Uh, Don, is it a Facebook site or is it a Hangout site? It's a Hangout site, but okay. I, you know, I would... uh, can uh, Don can send you a link uh, to the uh, Facebook Hangout site or the the Google Hangout site, and you can use your smartphone to access it. Like we had we had somebody do that recently too, didn't we? Here, yeah. uh, I, I'm. I wonder if uh, I'm going to stay on the conversation that I'm having um, with uh, Ed, and I'm going to go back to. Uh, I've got his Facebook here. Okay, you have it. I Good. do, and I am pasting in the link. Don so is can, sending you can, a link. If he can access his Facebook from his phone, he can get in through there. We can see you, Ed. You know that, right? Okay, but you you apparently have some so sound because you're talking into your computer, and uh, I'm hearing you. So you have microphone capabilities, but you don't hear us, or do you hear us? Or do you hear us? Do you hear Don when he talks? Apparently not. Can you hear me? 
can but you, hear me now. But you can't hear Don, right? You do hear Don. Oh, you don't hear Don. Okay. All right. Did Don, did you send him the link? I did. I sent it via Facebook. I did. I did. Okay. Does he have to get off this connection to get on the other one, Don? No. Uh -uh. He can just paste it in and get right on. Okay. So you can so just can paste it, it in. Via phone, you know, then then uh, you know, we can do that. So for those viewers that are there, hang on. We're gonna. Say, I think we're gonna make this happen in a minute or two. Didn't we do this with another guest not too long ago? We've done it with a couple of them. We did it with. Uh, um. Oh, it'll come to me. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, we've we've done it twice. Oh, Marsha Montenegro. We just did That's it with her. That's what I was thinking of, but I wasn't sure. And, and, and prior to that, we had done it with uh, had uh, had uh, done it with uh, New Ager, former New Ager, anyway. Uh, yeah. So uh, actually, the the uh, smartphones work pretty well. What's he doing? I hear him banging on something. I hear you banging on something, Ed. What's going on? I can see his lips moving. He's trying. He's trying to get into the link that you sent him. He's saying, and um, with his phone, with your phone, right, Ed? You're doing this, yeah. So it should be a matter of just clicking on the link, right, Don? Yeah, probably. Well, then he's got a series of prompts because he hasn't done it with his phone before. Oh, a series of prompts. Sign. Okay. Sign in his Google account and all of that. Oh, right. he's going to sign account. in the Google account. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hearing bing, bing, bing in the background, and, and every once in a while, Ed says something. So in the meantime, Ed, uh, Don has been so, talking about evolution. Yeah, Francis Collins. How about Francis Collins? Scientist. Uh, was in fact uh, uh, pretty big in the Obama administration, actually, and um, he uh, believes uh, that uh, all humans can track back their ancestry to uh, one pair, Adam and Eve. He he would call them. Hmm. Now he he he's a Christian, solid, pretty solid Christian, but he also is uh, uh, sort of a uh, believes that God guided evolution, so he does believe in evolution, but. Not that humans evolved from something else, rather that God created Adam and Eve, and then guided the evolutionary process after that. I have this um, speaker system that uh, has a control module that sits on my desk, and for for a while I was trying to figure out why aren't my speakers working. It turned out that there's an off switch on that control module, and I didn't know I had turned it off. And I was thinking I was going to have to throw out my speakers until I looked closely at this little module and noticed, hey, there's an off switch here. Turn it back on. Got my speakers back. Okay. Well, Stephanie is still hanging on, she says. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. So um, what if he simply called you and you put him on speaker, Don? I don't know how to do that exactly. Uh Hold, he, hold my phone hold my phone up to the mic yeah uh, I could give him my number and try it uh, okay. I'm going to uh, hey Ed can you hear me can you sign into our chat feature or here I'll tell you what I'll send it to you on uh, on Facebook uh, okay uh, here we go I'm going to give you my phone number here, Ed, and if you could call me, uh, I'm, I will. Um, this is too I'll, fun. I'll put your, um, I'll put the uh, phone up to the speaker. I'll put you on speaker, and then put the phone up to my mic. I should say. Hey, we got we got some new prayer cards. If that if anyone cares about that, I like that, huh? Uh -oh. Okay, Ed, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ed? Can you hear me now? Ed, I've, I've... Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Oh, okay. So, but you can't hear Don unless I unplug my speakers, right? That's going to be an issue. Well, 
Well, let's do the best we can. I'm going to have to work. We'll have to work the bugs out of this. Something's something's not right, and I don't know what it is. I'm going to have to do a dry run with Don and make sure all the settings are right. But um, some something's either turned on or turned off, and I'm interfering with something. So, so Don, you um, can you can hear him, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to unplug my headphones so that he can hear you. Okay. okay. So, but there might we might create an echo effect. So we'll see what happens. Okay, go ahead. Say something, Don. Say, say something, something, Don. Okay, Don, can you hear me? I can. I can. And you can okay. hear. And you can hear Don. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the only thing I'm concerned about is that Don might start getting an echo on his end, uh, or we might. I don't know. But we'll deal with that if it happens. Okay. Where were we, guys? Well, uh, I had talked about my experience in uh, uh, dealing with this professor who tried to defend Darwinian evolution, and that uh, Ed has an interesting uh, uh, way of approaching it as he talked with a scientist on the issue of biogenesis. So with that, now that we yeah. have you there, Ed. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm still here. Yeah, so biogenesis, I, I went down to the... Uh, to the atheist uh, reason rally, and it was my contention that uh, that that atheists, you know, they have a they have a they have a pony in this race also. So I decided to uh, ask them uh, the question about the, uh, the origin of life. So I went down and I I, I talked to this this uh, this atheist, really nice guy, and uh, I said his name was Alex, and I said Alex, I said, can you explain to me? Uh, Alexander O'Parent's postulation on biogenesis. And he stared uh, for just momentarily. It must have been three or four, five seconds. And he said, I don't even know who Alexander O'Parent is. I said, O'Parent was the one who came up with the idea of the primordial soup. He was a Russian scientist, uh, 1924, wrote a book called The Origin of Life. And um, so I want to know how a biogenesis works, formally the origin of life, the natural process by which life arises from non-living matter, such as simple organic compounds. And uh, so he began to uh, to tell me uh, how this all happened. Well, at first he didn't know who Oparin was, and Oparin is the, is, the, is the one who came up with the primordial soup. Uh, over a gradual period of time, complexity, uh, you know, uh, be, uh, simple things become more, uh, more, uh, more complex. It involves a molecular self-replication, self-assembly, um, auto-catalysis, uh, and cell membranes. And so all of the, all of the building blocks are, are in this soup. And uh, Alexander O'Parin uh, said that all the soup needed was something to agitate it. Now I won't go the whole, hold the whole through the whole list, but um, he said that uh, it was probably lightning. Which you now this is the guy, the atheist I was talking to. Alex said it was probably lightning. I said that's what O'Parent said. So lightning hits the pond, and all of a sudden we have first life. First life comes up, and then you know five billion years ago, five billion years or five billion years later, we're here talking about it. So the, um, the conversation began to uh, progress. And uh, I said, well, well, our ancestors, which is, which is Homo sapiens, we have our beginning around six million years ago, according to the Smithsonian Institute. The modern form of human, the, the modern form, our, our form, uh, evolved about 200 million years ago, or 200,000 years ago. Civilization, as we know, about six uh, six thousand years ago, and the industrial age started in the early eighteen hundreds. So we have a problem uh, mm -hmm. with this, and I began to 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 talk about uh, these problems. Now, according to the um, Smithsonian Institute, our earliest ancestor, this is our earliest human ancestors, is um, 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 our day. Typicus, okay, was based in Africa, and we begin to emerge around 200 million, 200 million years ago. The question is, when we get into recorded history, we only go back 6,000 years. So I was on the uh, campus of a, of a university, 
and a girl come up and I began to talk to her and she, her boyfriend was there and she mentioned uh, millions of years, millions and millions of years. And uh, even mentioned the word billion. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, how long has man been on the earth? And she said, millions of years. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, so here's my question. I said, how many people are on the earth right now? And she said, approximately seven to eight billion people. I said, about seven billion. And I said, that to she, I said, that's correct. I said, do you know that we have the exact date when mankind went over one billion? And she said, uh, uh, no. I said, 1803 was the first time the earth went over eight or went over one billion people. And I said, roll this back 2,000 years ago to the time of Christ. And I said, you have approximately, do you know how many people were on the earth approximately at that time? And she had no idea. I said, well, according to some, whoever you, you, you talk to, the consensus is around 400, billion, 400 million people are on the earth about this time. Now I said, roll back, roll it back another 4,000 years, as we're at 6,000 years, or we're at the biblical creation. I said, you're out of people. I said, you have run out of people at 6,000 years. So my question is, is if man has been on the earth, if we could generate um, six to seven billion people in the space of 6,000 years, and it's all mathematics, you can, you can run this back, how or where are all the bodies if man has been on the earth for 200 million years? Imagine the body count. Imagine the fossils. You mean 200,000 or 200 million? You mean 200,000, right? 200,000, yes. Yeah, okay. Two, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, 6 million. Uh, 6 million uh, years we've been on, or the, let's see, let me back up. The first tangible link to humanity starts around 6 million years ago with primates called... Um, uh, our our day Pythicus, and that was the beginning. That was our earlier ancestors. Then it goes into Anthropocet, uh, Anthropopithecus, and then we move up into uh, Para Parapus, and then we end up with with Homo sapien. Mm -hmm. Could they and, be, could they all be buried under the Antarctic ice sheet? And maybe global <laughs> warming. You know, maybe when the uh, South Pole ice sheet melts, we'll see where all the we'll bodies find them all. They'll all be there. Yeah, that's what I'm. Thinking. Well, that's a that's a that's a that's an interesting possibility, but um, <laughs> I, the, I'm not uh, serious. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know the you know when you <clears throat> she 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 had an immediate reaction to this, and I said it's just math, <clears throat> and I said if you can explain this, <clears throat> my my friend um, my my atheist friend that I met at the Reason Rally, Alex, he had a he had a, a very typical time putting into words and articulating what biogenesis. I said, I just want to know how it happened. So at one point, as he's telling me this, he looks at me and he said, what's your position? I said, I'm a creationist. I said, I believe in, in creation. I said, I'm a Christian. And I said, I want to know how you guys explain this. I said, I don't want to read it in a book. I want to come down and talk to the people who actually hold these views. Can you explain to me how a biogenesis works? Well, they have no, they have no, uh, they have no idea. They just know that it was uh, natural and that it uh, flies in the face of, of, of metaphysics because of their idea that science can answer everything. If science does not have the answer, or they do not have the answer empirically from science then what they do is they drop back and they say, well, we don't know, but eventually science will vindicate our ignorance and we will know these gaps. But we do know right now that it was not a metaphysical uh, thing. That's we we out, know that's, that. We know that yeah. for sure. For sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They know that for sure. And then when you go back, Ron, when you go back and we look at the evidence, we all have the same data. We all go back and we unpack the data. The data okay, gets the point. I, 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 I like it. I like it. I like it. Hold the data because we're going to take a break. Uh, we we it, it's time, Ron. Time is, is it time? Yes. Yes, because I, I I'm getting outraged at the, at the moment. It kind of gets you upset, doesn't it? Well, anyways, uh, we have some questions for you guys out there. How, have those boring family dinners become unbearable? Excuse me, unbearably tedious. Uh, do you wonder when someone will invent a board game that gives your life a real purpose? Do you want to be part of something 
bigger than yourself while remaining the center of your universe? Well, we have just what you're looking for. The Real McCoy Gaming Company presents Where's the Outrage? The game where the woke shall inherit the earth. Well, unless, of course, you're white male. In any case, there is no, there are no unfair inequality promoting dice in Where's the Outrage. The rules for taking turns are really quite simple. Each player gets points for being in an oppressed group. And there's the list of oppressed groups you can belong to. The more oppressed groups you belong to, the more points. Turns are taken in the order of the most points. Next, you choose a bankroller. He's also known as the game's George Soros. The George Soros then proceeds to distribute the game cards and you get game cards for everything you need to be a true social justice warrior. So then each player chooses a game piece and places it on the forward space. Next, we pick who is going to go first. And in this case, it's Brienne Old, an African-American, Native American, non-binary, transgender, former female. She gets, or I'm sorry, he gets to go. And he picks the Christian-owned bakery. Remember, there are no dice, so he picks his own spot where he wants to go. And he draws a free lawyer's card immediately, and then he begins to occupy that space until it belongs to him. This is an amazing game. His next move, he goes past the free speech zone. He does not have to go into it because he grabbed an entitlements card. Therefore, he can just blow off those fascist white supremacists and their stupid free speech. Yes, where's the outrage? It's the game where the woke shall inherit the earth and it comes from the Real McCoy Gaming Company. Give your life real purpose now. I like it. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Everybody wants to play that game. Uh, all right. So we're back. And uh, you, had, uh, you were talking about... Uh, biogenesis. A uh, biogenesis. Yes. And I don't remember what your last words were. So we're going to unpack the evidence. Unpack the evidence. Go ahead. Yes. Well, when you look at when you go back and you they start interviewing um, scientists. Of course, this is the official position, but off the record, scientists are saying they have no idea how a biogenesis works. It's an uncontroversial among uh, sciences that's what they're saying that's the that's the party line but nobody there's not a single general accepted model for the origin of life and, and when you push them how did life begin they are dogmatic and they are um, absolutely convinced that this is the way it happened but they don't know how they don't know where and uh, they don't know exactly when but they do know that it was natural that it was completely unguided and that it had no physic, uh, metaphysical uh, overtones went out. So they, they, they put us in the camp of myth while they sit back and smugly say, even though we don't have the answer, empirically, our justification will come when science catches up with our ignorance mm. on this particular issue. So in the movie Expelled, uh, I forget the name of the guy who, who made the movie. Scheller. So Scheller. Is it Sh Scheller? No. Shelly? Uh, but Don's going to look it up on Google and tell yeah, us. I, I, I uh, am, yeah. They, uh, in the movie Expelled, they asked, they, they backed uh, one of the uh, evolutionary biologists into a corner on this question, you know, how did the first single-celled cell form, of, or how did the first form of life evolve? How did it come into existence? And he, of course, gave a whole bunch of disclaimers. We really don't know, but we have a really good idea. Okay, what is your really good idea? Well, it evolved on the backs of crystals. Yes. Ben Stein. Ben Stein. I knew it was a Ben. Expelled, no intelligence allowed. No, expelled, no intelligence allowed. It's about, uh, it's really not about creationism per se, but really about intelligent design, um, which is somewhat separate from, I mean, it's not quite creationism. Uh, and so Ben Stein, you know, was asking this fellow the question and he wasn't, for some reason, he wasn't satisfied with the answer. It started on the backs of crystals. He wanted something more specific and the fellow got really upset. He goes, I told you, he had a British accent, it's on the backs of crystals. So this became a kind of in-house joke at uh, among the group of Christians I was with who watched the film. 
Uh, because, yeah, you told us it was on the backs of crystals, but that really doesn't tell us much of anything. In right, fact, right, right, right. All, all we know is that crystals change. Crystals uh, are, can change under various circumstances, but how is that anything remotely similar to the kind of mutations, to the kind of changes that occur in evolution? And well, we're looking at, yeah. And we're looking for that evidence. And it's interesting, Ron, when you press press them on this subject um, about how and why, which is which is the position they take, they they don't have a lot of good answers. Matter of fact, many of them have differing answers. But it's almost like going to a new age fair. It doesn't matter what you believe, as, as long as what you believe causes you to become a good person or brings you into an astrological um, sphere. The the, the Atheists are a lot like that in that they can hold various views about how biogenesis comes and hold each other in high esteem while disagreeing vehemently about their position, but they are unanimous in their voice yeah. that there is no metaphysical explanation for this. It happened naturalistically. That they know. And um, they, their fallback is that, and I call it scientism, their fallback is Yes, we don't know yet, but science will one day vindicate us. So it's like science in the gap. Yeah. We can't answer that now, so science will one we, day we have, tell us. We have, we have the God of the gaps, now we have the science of the gaps. You know, I have a, um, I, I have an analogy. Well, you, you, first of all, I'd like to say that science is by no means, uh, I mean, it is filled with examples of scientific theories and explanations that turned out to be total hogwash, you know, I mean, even the, the theories that pre, pre, predated Darwinian evolution, you know, the spontaneous generation and all that. And some people would argue that Darwinianism is really just a more complex version of spontaneous generation. Of course, they will be left out of court, you know, when they say that, but, you know, th people don't listen to them. Um, but, you know, I um, would like to um, draw an analogy here. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what that analogy was. So uh, I was I, I started rambling, and that's how I lost it. The um, but the uh, I, the analogy you now I now I remember is the phrase borrowed capital. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Where, for instance, uh, Francis Schaeffer would talk about how our founding fathers, so many of them were not believers but they lived on the borrowed capital of Christianity. Some of them were deists, Unitarians, right, and right. so on. Right, right. And, but they still held on to all these principles from Scripture. Even though they denied the authority of Scripture, they were still clinging to biblical principles, and he called that borrowed capital. And that borrowed capital helped them think, and it helped them draw the conclusions that they drew, even though they really had no right to use it. They had borrowed it. And I think evolution has some borrowed capital it has borrowed the capital of science in general, the scientific method. If we look, especially as we look at the last 250 years, the scientific method has been enormously successful. If you think about, it. I mean, look at what look at the, the equipment that we are using right now. Look at what we know about the planets because we were able to send robots to them. You know, in many cases, look at all of the conveniences we have in life which were a product of the scientific method. Science in general uh, has proven enormously successful at making predictions that come true. Yes. And, and so now evolution, on the other hand, has really yet to make a single prediction that I can think of. Um, you know, they say, well, we predicted that we would find these fossils. Well, no, you, you found the fossils and then you fit them into your framework but where did you predict any of this? You know, I I, I don't see it. You know, I I'm open I'm open well, to correction well, here. As I started, started to, started to, started to say, say is, is, we have we a have sense, sense of evidence. evidence. It is how we then come to understand how the evidence came to be. And to me, looking at this idea of evolution, is sort of it's like uh, solving a murder mystery. It's already happened. It's something that happened in the past. What you're trying to figure out is how it happened. And right. so I would walk into uh, the the scene uh, and find, let's say, the body is laying in the middle of the floor. Uh, the uh, door has been uh, apparently kicked open. 
there's a little round hole right in the center of the forehead, uh, and uh, there's blood all over the floor, particularly around that area where they bled out. And I would then say, okay, he was assassinated, shot to death in some way for some reason, uh, and that's our starting point. He was shot to death. But an evolutionist comes in the room and goes, no, he suffered uh, a broken neck falling down uh, two flights of stairs except this is a ranch house, there are no stairs in there. Oh, yes, but if we look hard enough, we will find stairs someplace that he fell down, and that's how it happened. They just invent things whole out of whole cloth that are not verifiable. You can't prove them anywhere. Well, what you, what you the argument you just gave is similar to the old, I forget if the guy's name was Paisley or whatever his name was. He talks about, let's say you're walking through the woods, you're, you're far away from a city and you're, you're just simply in a forest somewhere. You're out in nature. There, there aren't any other people around you. And you come across a pocket watch laying on the ground. Uh, how do you explain the existence of this pocket watch? Where did it come from? You pick it up, you examine it, you see uh, things like that you've never seen anywhere else in nature. Uh, you see, you know, things that are associated with, you know, m machines and people and all that. And of course, you know, your your his conclusion was you, you don't assume that it just kind of developed there in that location. Right. It, didn't, it didn't just grow out of the ground. It didn't just fall from the sky. You know, you have to come up with a different explanation. Um, but the um, what what I'm getting at is is that uh, in order for science to be science, the scientific method involves uh, making a hypothesis about you know if if I do this, then this will happen. And then testing that hypothesis via experimentation and then recording your results. Did Was my hypothesis confirmed or was it disproven? Well, evolution can't do anything like that. It, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, uh, if, you, if that becomes your definition for what is science, then evolution is not science. Well, sorry, the one or two principles of the scientific method is, is it has to be observable. Right. And it has to be repent. Uh, um, it has to be uh, repeatable. Science is a very, very strong mechanism for uh, for uh, for developing truth. However, it is not the only way of, of getting that. We, we, for example, we can't prove historical arguments. Right. I can't prove. I can't prove historically that that uh, that twenty minutes ago we just lost the sound. I can't prove that historically, <laughs> testimonially, or historically. We use a different method. There are several different methods of proving this thing, and the the uh, the scientific method is a very robust and very powerful way. But it is not the only way of of, of, of finding evidence. So when we come back to the the idea that everything has to be proved empirical through the five senses are are the the, um, the uh the scientific method comes in very handy because that's what it's geared to do however it cannot provide other information and it's not it does not have the, the ability to draw a conclusion it can tell us what but it can't tell us why so as we move back into history and that's what i ask the scientist, I said, can you give me a scientific basis for biogenesis? And they really can't. It's a lot of hypothesis. I was in a schoolroom one day, um, a, a girl come up uh, who, who goes to my church, and she asked me if I would come in and I would present the evolution or the, the Christian side, the, the, her, um, uh, her, um, uh, her teacher was an evolutionist and they wanted me to give the Christian perspective. And I did pretty much what you did, Ron. I said, look, I said, when we take the two models, and this is how I, I started, the creation model predicts what we are finding in the fossil record. The evolutionary model has to explain it, whereas the creation model predicts it. Mm -hmm. We pre the, the, uh, the, Christian, the, the creation model predicts that we would find things fully formed in, in the fossil record, we do right. not find intermediate, uh, uh, gradual uh, things from one species into into another, and uh, we we just don't find that. We find things fully formed, and we find things uh, which is exactly what the creationist model would predict. Well, evolution also has another hurdle, a prediction related hurdle to overcome. It's that there are actually two of them. One is 
if life emerged from non-life once, why doesn't it happen repeatedly? And now uh, they can answer that because they can simply, you know, they can hypothetically answer it at least they could to their own satisfaction, which is that there must be certain conditions for that to happen. And those conditions don't exist anymore. So That's they, exactly what he said. Yeah. They only existed in the early earth. The other question though, is if you, when you, when you consider the sheer number of genetic mutations that must have taken place to bring, you know, uh, to bring human, to bring every every single form of life that exists into existence, the question is: Why are we not still observing these kinds of mutations today? Mm -hmm. Now they will they will every time I've seen them try to answer this, they've tried they they have a, something that they call speciation, where new species are allegedly created almost on a daily basis. Every time I've looked at these, they don't really match what we mean by a new species. In other words, an advanced, we're talking about differentiation within a, a life form where it perhaps even it gets to the point where this differentiation is so, uh, is so um, pronounced that the members of the new group do no, no longer mate with the members of the old group. Okay, that they try to make that part of a definition of a species, but not always, they're not consistent. Because with too many exceptions, you know, you have you have ligers and you have mules and so on, where you have different species mating with each other. So, um, so in any case, they, you know, we we um, we're not seeing new, real new advances, real new. In other words, no new brand of human has emerged in the last two hundred thousand years, or, or has it? You know, have have you seen one? You know, you know, if you're, if you're not watching the X Men movies, then I don't know where you find them. Yes, no, you're absolutely right, and um, the uh, the explanation as you push, they they feel that um, they feel that an I don't know is adequate, uh, whereas when we we tell them we don't know. Um, they will tell us that we are faith-based yeah. and uh, we, we are following a myth. But my question is, if this much change, and it's an enormous amount of change that occurred in a relatively short period of time, when you think about how many changes had to occur, why do they suddenly stop? Yes. Why, why, mm -hmm. why, are, why, is the change, why, why isn't the change still going on? Evolution basically means change. Well, that's why developmental you have, yeah. change. That's why they need deep time, because deep time, given enough time, given the chance hypothesis and enough time, you know, you can create right. or you can you can get this. So they, they need this deep time. And the longer and the more complex life becomes and the more they look at this, the, the longer the time period becomes. But um, that's yeah. never been observed. It's well, never been observed. Right. And, and deep time may be sufficient to explain the amount of change that was needed to to go from a single cell to us it may be yeah. sufficient not all not well, all well, evolutionary well. biologists even agree on that no yeah, yeah. And, and, you know I, I had an interesting thing a couple of years back i was talking about this biogenesis as a matter of fact uh and uh they said well you know scientists have now created life uh in uh in uh the lab i said really and so there's an article on uh from the daily mail from 2014 uh, that uh, talks about how uh, researchers zapped clay in a chemical soup with laser to simulate uh, the energy of speeding asteroids smashing into the planet and ended up creating what could be considered crucial pieces of the building blocks of life. Right. So I, I asked him, I said, let's, let's think about this uh, together because apparently you haven't thought about it individually. Uh, and and uh, here's, here's just a series of questions about this. Let's assume that they created life in, in a lab. Were they intelligent scientists, or did it just happen unguided time plus chance? <laughs> no one was watching, and it just sort of just happened one day. Life just sprang up. Do you think the scientists thought they were intelligent, and they've had degrees and, and that sort of thing? Was it guided by the scientists? And he said, well, it was guided. I said, so what you're really telling me is that it took intelligence guidance to create this, what you think is a spark of life, so you're really arguing for intelligent design. You're not arguing for time plus chance, right? 
Right. And, and they and they're also they might fall back and say, well, no, it took intelligence to simulate the conditions that existed at the time, in, in which case I would answer, well, how many lasers do you think were being used uh, or were, were in existence? And then they'll say, well, you know, it, the lasers just helped to simulate that what, what, what the conditions were. And, I, and, and my next question is, how do we know what the conditions were? Th those are purely. Yeah. Purely hypothetical, purely, purely conjecture, right? Conjecture. You're absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right, Ron. And the, um, the the experiment was done in 1952, 53, with Yuri and, uh, and and Miller. And the excite and, and in the experiments that they did, these were two. One, they were both from Chicago, and they did this experiment. And um, but they made, going back to your point, they made assumptions, okay, about the right. the conditions of they they so. They didn't know what the conditions of the Earth was, you know, in their thing with five billion years ago. They had no idea what the conditions were, so they made certain assumptions. And they stacked the deck by, by putting in an enormous amount of, I mean, they couldn't fail. And um, so they did create some kind of, uh, of reaction, but it, it never reproduced. It never, it never, it never spawned. In other words, it didn't start a new civilization, but they were right. able to create some kind of amino acids that did, did spark from that experiment. But it goes back to what Don said. There was a lot of effort that went into it. There was a lot of manipulation and there was this built in assumption that the conditions for the experiment were vastly more concentrated than what, what, what they used in that laboratory. Right. Well, yeah, there's a, 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 an unusually campy episode of Star Trek. Uh, maybe you remember it with the, where there were these, um, this humanoid species on this one planet that was, they were warring with each other. And one of them was black on the white side, right side and yes, white on the left that, side. Yes. And the other was reversed. And, um, the, um, and so, uh, Frank Gorshin, the guy who played the Riddler on Batman was the main, one of the main characters in this. And, uh, he was arguing with, you know, Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock, and this is one of the most insightful moments regarding evolution in television broadcast history, as far as I'm concerned. Frank, Frank Gorshin's character says, I understand that you humans believe you evolved from apes. At which point, Mr. Spock said, the actual theory is that lower life forms developed into higher life forms. And, and, I th and that's like a, a, an amazing little encapsulated insight here because when we're arguing about evolution we're not really just arguing about change we're arguing about going from lower to higher so, so when i was asking earlier why aren't we seeing evolution happen now i mean it it, it must have happened at a, a fairly brisk pace even though it yes. looks even though we think of it as slow not really i mean to get from from when when they think evolution probably began maybe two billion BC, I mean the Earth had to cool off. It was the Earth, the Earth's four billion years old. It took a couple billion years just to cool the planet off, so life could start. And two billion BC going to now over two billion years now. There, I mean the change when you calculate the number of changes that had to occur every so many I don't know centuries. There had to be a significant change to push things forward in a whole bunch and a whole gamut of species. And then on top of that, they all get wiped out 65 million years ago. And, so, and, and the, there's a Precambrian explosion. Then they all get wiped out or the, the majority of them get wiped out by an asteroid and you almost start all over again. And then you get to us today. The, 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 the number of changes had to take place at a fairly brisk pace and they had to go from lower to higher species. Why aren't we seeing butterflies develop into more complex organisms? Why aren't we seeing dogs evolve so that they start standing upright and, you know, taking our dictation on the computer? I mean, why are, why are these things not happening? Why are not other primates? Why, why are we the only primate species, so to speak, that is, intelligent that can understand language with the kind of facility that we have. Well, another thing too that, yeah, 
another thing too is you know the uh, endangered species that, um, that that man has stepped into. If you know, think of we're all just evolving. Why does one species concerned about another species? And if the climate cl changes and the conditions for these animals are becoming threatened, so that the animal can't survive in these new situations, then they die. Then they die off. Which in evolutionary um, uh, dicta dictate that that's not a big problem because they now cease to. Um, to, to uh, have the ability to adapt, either they die. So they're not adapting, they're dying. And um, if it's not for human intervention, um, a lot of these species would have died off years ago. We've made laws and we've, we've intervened in a lot of these places to make sure the species don't die out. But yet they're not adapting, Ron. They're not, uh, the evolutionary mechanism is not kicking in to adapt mm -hmm. to the new environment that uh, that's coming. They're, uh, they're succumbing to it. And it's not as though we're like a big asteroid hitting the Earth, you know. Which is where are all the transitional fossils? And I wanted to bring this up, but you guys are kind of, uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the late Stephen Jay Gould, who I really liked uh, a lot, he, was, he seemed like a really kind guy and, and, and you know, fairly smart, admitted that there's no transitional fossils, and he was... Uh, uh, often in trouble by other evolutionists because of that. And he argued for punctuated equilibrium or the hopeful monster theory, which was actually uh, brought into place by Richard Goldsmith. Uh, and uh, Theodosius uh, Dobzhansky wrote about this, this uh, punctuated equilibrium that is uh, systematic mutations, he says, have never been observed, which is something that the late Stephen Jay Gould also said. Uh, it's possible to imagine a mutation so drastic that the product becomes a monster hurling itself beyond the confines of species, genus, family, or class. The assumption that such a product may, however rarely, walk the earth overtaxes one credulity. So he didn't he didn't see how that, that would really work. Uh, Gould liked the idea. So in their mind, uh, a lizard laid an egg, or a reptile laid an egg, and out popped a bird. It's, it's kind of happened that fast. Yeah. When you look at some of the solutions that evolutionary biologists have proposed for their own, to solve their own problems, they remind me a lot of the solutions that astronomers proposed in order to not go with Copernicus's theory of heliocentrism. I mean, they, they, they kept creating these like little patchwork. How do you explain uh, retrogressive motion, the retrogressive motion of the planets. Uh, I, well, okay, so Ptolemy, they revise the Ptolemaic theory. They do this, they do that. Um, it, all in order to keep to maintain a geocentric universe until finally uh, Isaac Newton provides the final piece of the puzzle that shows that the most elegant solution to the problem uh, when he came up with his theory of, you know, universal gravitation, uh, obviously was Copernicus's all along. Uh, uh, gravitation explains everything that Copernicus's theory, uh, it, makes, it makes it work, it makes it feasible. And so uh, it's almost as though we're seeing the same thing happen with evolution. They're, they're coming up with these little, okay, we, we, we can't explain how this happened gradually because the systems are so complex how could how could you develop first a, a an optic nerve and then a retina and then a, a cornea and then an eyeball how, how could you do that well you hit punctuated equilibrium let's use that oh we're not sure whether time is deep enough to account for all this evolution that happened how about uh, panspermia uh, you know life was originally imported on either an alien spaceship or an uh, an asteroid floating through space um, and there have been, I mean, we're talking about, that. I mean, Francis Crick, one of the followers of, Smart, founders of right. DNA, uh, was a believer in that or a proponent of it. Uh, and these are kind of wacky theories when you think. Well, it's, it, it, it is kind of a wacky theory, but it, it does afford them something that they don't get otherwise, which is they don't have to answer the question of, of how it began because they've just moved it to someplace else in the universe that we can't get to. Right. I mean, what was that movie? Um Prometheus, and even 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, they're both based on the idea of panspermia. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and we're talking about serious scientists saying that basically we're like Martians, really. I mean, our DNA came from somewhere else in the universe, maybe even Mars well, itself. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons why we have SETI. Um, and uh, SETI right. is a government uh, program to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And we are spending multiple billions of dollars on the premise that if life started here spontaneously, it could have sparked, happened someplace else. So if we can find other places in the universe that have the same construct that we do, we are likely going to find colonizations of life forms that may be beyond us and can help us through our adolescent uh, technology. And uh, so the optimism is to continue to spend millions of dollars on a theory, on a premise that is unproven, but based on the speculation that life started here in a natural way. And if it started here that way, it could very well have started yeah. in another place. And so they could come to serve man, right? Correct. Just like, yes. <laughs> just like in the Twilight Zone episode, only the the to serve man phrase came from a cookbook that they were preparing to use for us. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like uh, uh, Carl Sagan, famous atheist, who starts his uh, started a show off uh, every week with uh, uh, the, the universe is all there is, all there was, and all there ever will be. Will be the cosmos. Right? The yeah. cosmos, yeah. Uh, and 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 he he wrote a book, and then they made a film of it called Contact. Well, what's the what's the basic premise of Contact? That there is life out there, uh, and that they they communicated to us through. Our satellites, our SETI satellites, oddly enough, uh, and uh, gave us the uh, blueprints to design a, a machine which would then put uh, the star, uh, Jody Foster, in contact with these far more advanced enlightened beings living somewhere else in the universe. Now, how, what do you have to have in order to believe all of that? Well, faith, that's all. Yeah. It's not actually science, I mean, it's just another religion. It's a very entertaining movie. Very, I mean, this is the I thing. I liked it. I thought it was well done. And and uh, and we're right now we're at a spot in history where postmodernism is so infecting the sciences that it doesn't bother a lot of scientists that they're taking so much on faith. I, I heard a um, I heard a, a presentation. I forget where I heard it. It was either on a TED Talk or on PBS someplace. And this this evolutionary biologist was talking about. I mean, he was he was describing the panorama. He 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 was very good with words, and he was able to spread out the panorama of evolution before you just with his words in really an amazing way. I I, I found it very enthralling as I'm listening to it. And, and of course, but my the sign you know my my left brain is saying, okay, you know, where's the science behind this? And uh, he he never goes there. He says. You know, we, we don't know exactly how all this happened, but it's a compelling story. Yeah. It's a compelling yes. story. And, and really, that is the essence of postmodernism. Is your story compelling enough that people are going to want to hear it? doesn't matter whether it's true. It doesn't matter if it's true. Just if it's compelling. true for you, and if it's compelling, if you can make it compelling for others, then you can bring people into your truth. And all truth is really just a manner of speaking, really. And postmodernism. So, there you go. There you go. And where you know, wherever I go, there I am. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> uh, Ron, uh, you know, it is time we've run over. We've had a little uh, technical difficulties today, but we did manage to get through. I felt like uh, I think Ed felt like he got run over. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, we're gonna uh, over the next week or two. Ed and I are gonna have to connect up and see if we can fix this because he's gonna be on with us again. Yeah, let's, let's do that. I wanted to get together with you and work out the bugs in this thing. I'll get this fixed. And um, so next time we won't have this problem. Okay. I apologize. All right, Ron, you want to walk us out of here? Okay. Or we can do a fast gallop either way. Uh, mm -hmm. Our uh, resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager is see how it fits you. Our culinary services come from Chef Hammond Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is Justin K. Our Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D. Opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polygamous. 
Our liberal denominations bureau chief is Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Our special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys is O D Humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is Yoleg Pulling. Our technical assistance comes through Murky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our Grievance Resolutions Director is Yovana Pisani. Our Director of Privacy Assurance is Wiretapping, and our original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for its content, but you will never prove that in a court of law. You will not meet the uh, necessary uh, criteria of the scientific method or of legal <laughs> jurisprudence. Or... Or you know, none of the above, you know, and it's never it, happened to before. It never happened. Yeah. All right, all right, guys. Uh, if you hold on, we're going to end the broadcast. And uh, to those who did tune in, we apologize for a little inconvenience, but we got through it. Uh, and uh, we will see you all next week. <laughs>